So let me just fill you in exactly where I'm at. So I'm currently in the midst of an epic collection purge as discussed in my previous video. In fact, I've already cut my collection down by a quarter. Now, that does not mean I'm gonna stop making content on YouTube. Quite the opposite, in fact. This might be the coolest stage of my journey yet as I narrow the collection down to those core keepers. Along with the hunt for that final grail watch. So, let's roll the intro. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I'll do a very quick wristwatch check wearing the Laurier Safari that I co-designed with this amazing brand, the salmon pink dial version, and I've matched it, perfect for summer, and to match the shirt, obviously, uh, the melange strap from Wrist Candy Watch Club. Just really, really great for summer because it's breathable, light, and ultra comfortable, and extremely well made. So this, is a list of the 31 watches currently in my collection. Sometimes if you're like me and you keep most of them in the bank vault and you kind of rotate, this is a great way to have an overview of what you currently have, kind of to take stock, so to speak. Now, if you're new to the channel, I do my annual State of the Collection in December, kind of to wrap up the year. This year, I aim to halve my collection from last year and then do that again the following year and so on until I get to a small, focused, core cool collection of keepers, and that's it. I want to enjoy them, focus on several other career and life goals, along with traveling a bit more, but I will always make watch content, as there's so much more to it than merely the rather antediluvian thrill of the hunt. There's factory visits, interviews, endless horological history to dive into, stories to explore, the odd super affordable gem to share with you guys, and of course, tons of new stuff to borrow and review. And every so often, there might even just be an impulse buy, but that doesn't really happen too often for me. Yeah, there's still the uh, Hublot Classic Fusion. I do like that watch. And it also has the added benefit of upsetting all the watch knobs. Yeah, I might just have to uh, get it out of my system, buy it, experience it. Who knows? I might fall in love like I did with the Panerai. Now, I've talked about my love for the high-end Swiss independent brand, Roman Gautier, and his Insight Microrotor to death on this channel for donkey's years, so I will spare you the lecture. But essentially, it had quite an effect on me after touring his factory in the early days of the channel and having him personally elucidate and demonstrate every part of the process. It was difficult not to be impressed, but beyond that, the Insight Micro Rotor compared to most offerings in the horology world, full of gaudy monstrosities, is nothing but understated good taste. But my obsession with the watch does confirm one thing for me. I know my final grail will be something on the more dressy side and possibly some kind of skeletonized feature with a complication to show off the inner workings. I mean, if you're gonna spend all that money, you kinda wanna see what you're paying for. However, there is one big problem and you could probably guess what it is with the Insight Micro Rotor. And my British side makes me feel rather uncomfortable talking about it, but it costs, yep, insert the theme music here. Yeah, it costs ducktails amounts of money. The problem is not saving up and working hard for it. I'm quite used to doing that. In fact, it's the honorable thing to do, in my opinion. It's what makes reaching that goal so sweet in the end. And I feel you just appreciate it more. You guys know I'm no silver spooner, but putting that noblesse oblige sensibility aside, just for a moment, we are talking about watches closer to six figures in price. 
my inner watch designer would rather put that money towards creating something of my own from scratch. For those that don't know, it never costs less than six figures of investment to produce even the most simple watches. And I speak from experience now, having co-designed or designed almost a dozen watches. So this is the new uh, 39mm tourbillon from Federic Constant for 2023. Now I've talked about this before and it's a brand that I've grown to really respect. But what is just incredible about this is the ultra competitive price. And they always seem to punch way above their weight. And we're going to find out why and how in just a moment. Bear in mind, the average Swiss made tourbillon starts off at 40 grand and sky's the limit. Whereas this is on the market, one of 350, it starts off at 15,675 bucks. How is this meraviglia of, of engineering even possible at this price range? Let's, uh, let's find out. Well, it's because FC invested heavily in their manufacturing capabilities back in Geneva, all 3,200 square meters of it, in fact. Thank you, Wikipedia, for that fact. This has resulted in a quiet storm of in-house production since 2001, and over the subsequent decades has expanded into developing over 30 proprietary calibers. They do all sorts, from world timers to the previously reviewed perpetual calendar, even hybridized smartwatch technology, and everything in between. Oh, and let's not forget the highly innovative, super high frequency slimline monolithic we covered last year. FC unveiled its first automatic FC 980 caliber with a tourbillon in 2008, but now we finally see it in a more conservative 39mm case. There's also a rose gold version, limited to 100 pieces too. So there's a silver dial, which I'll put on this side of the screen, and then of course this uh, midnight blue, they call it, and I think it's absolutely captivating. It gives it a bit of pizzazz without being too, as they say in Italian, scargiante, you know, flashy or gaudy. I think this is absolutely spot on, and out of the two, definitely does it for me. You know what I'm gonna say, uh, <laughs> pure class indeed. The entirely stainless steel polished case is quintessentially modern, kept uncomplicated and minimalist as if not to distract attention away from the main attraction. The onion style crown and lance handset are very fitting here. Elements found always in more traditional watches rooted in classic pocket watch design language. I really feel it's the perfect choice here and complements the applied spear tip hour markers extremely well which are then omitted at the five, six, and seven to give way for the circular open heart tourbillon, displaying the seconds in such mesmeric effect. It's the proportions here that makes it really work. Sized in a diameter that stretches from the central position of the main hands to the periphery of the dial. In such a manner, I'm sure Fibonacci himself with his golden ratio would have been pleased. For those that don't know this complication, it was conceived by the British watchmaker and inventor John Arnold, but it was his Swiss French friend, the watchmaker Abraham Louis Breguet, who actually developed and patented it in 1801. Essentially, a tourbillon is the escapement and balance wheel mounted in a rotating cage. The goal of which is to eliminate errors of poise in the balance, giving a uniform weight and thus exceptional accuracy. Now, these are not cheap to produce. FC has spared no expense either. The movement is presented with traditional techniques like beveling, beading, circular graining, thermal bluing, guilloche, Cote de Genève, straight grained flanks, whatever that is, mirror polishing, so basically tart it up to the nines. But most astonishingly of all, it even has a display back while managing to be only 10.9 millimeters tall. So speaking of Breguet, why not Breguet? Unfortunately, and I've discussed this in a previous video, that I went to one of their events at Carnegie Hall in New York City, and yeah, it's an incredibly impressive brand. The history, their contribution to high horology is unmistakable, undeniable, but the event really put me off the entire brand, unfortunately. And as beautiful as they are, and I mean, they really are beautiful. Oh, look at this.
So in terms of negatives, well, my only concern would be serviceability. Obviously, uh, Federico Constant are the only people that can uh, service or address any issues, but them being a, a, a big brand now, um, and they're going to be around, and also they've got the might of a citizen behind them, I'm rest assured they're going to be there, uh, which is something you can't really say for every smaller independent brand. Are they going to be there in uh, 10 years, 20 years, you know, when it's time to to uh, have this looked at. And it's a fairly robust watch as well. We got that uh, proprietary silicon escapement wheel that's done in their um, kind of heraldic logo, uh, which is very anti-magnetic and of course temperature resistant. So as far as turbines go, it's quite a tough one. And then of course there's the water resistance at only 50 meters, but we're in dress watch territory. I mean, who goes swimming with a turbine anyway? <laughs> That would be kind of cool though. Yeah, there's not really that much to complain about here. I think it's an exquisitely done watch. I really do. My only issue really is limited to 350 pieces. I have a feeling I might miss out if, uh, you know, if I don't make a decision quick. All right, you all know the drill. So you're probably thinking by now, why not another of the high horology usual suspects? You may have spotted in my new intro for 2023 and beyond, a book on Patek. It's perhaps the family name that is on the lips of everyone when going horology. But with their lacklustre new 2023 offerings, I feel it's a brand that has become synonymous with those with more money than class or good taste. It's a brand that has kind of lost their luster in my eyes. Not to diminish their achievements, of course not. Nobody can deny Patek is one of the greatest brands when it comes to this kind of thing. My Genta designed white shadow, which I've discussed in a previous video, itches the ellipse scratch. A watch that, let's be honest, completely ripped off his design from a few years earlier. Incidentally, it's one of the few Pateks I actually would consider. But I have the original white shadow, so that's that out of the picture. In many ways, FC is what Patek used to be, and I know I'm going to upset the overly sensitive watch snobs out there, but I'm always one for rooting for the underdog. Speaking of which, what about more underrated German brands? With my recent pilgrimage to the place my last Grey watch was manufactured from Hanhart, Germany is obviously on my radar now. Perhaps the most important video I will make this year. Do check it out if you missed it. It's absolutely essential viewing if you truly appreciate real, independent and historic brands beyond all the samey, same, boring, overhyped brands. Definitely check out that video. Yeah, it's one yeah. thing to wear a watch, but then to see where it was put together, yeah. assembled and yeah. regulated, it's, this, that's magic. Still, uh, after all these years, I feel the same. Yeah. Right, of yeah. course. <laughs> But essentially, seeing firsthand the mastery and tradition of watchmaking in Germany so alive, it was impressive to say the least. And I look forward to returning to that wonderful country. It's a rather big box, as you can see, but there's something else in here which I want to share with you. Now, I was going to do a review of this watch, but I'm actually going to send it back. But there's no harm in having a little look. So I've removed the box within the box, within the outer box. Now the outer box was uh, incredibly large because Moya were kind enough to send a beautiful book called Impressions on the History of Glass Hutter. And this is, well, you'll see in just a moment, this is the Panomatic Calendar, the one I really am interested in. And guys, do let me know which you'd like to see reviewed in the comments. But I'm eyeing the white dial steel Panomatic Luna, uh, which is about, I think, um, a third or half the price of this one because this as you'll see in a moment is rose gold and I'm not a fan of rose gold so that's why I'm gonna send this one back and of course this arrived just as they restocked with the um, Panomatic uh, Luna anyway drum roll please da -da 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 -da. oh wow my god look that is that is, uh, let's, let's get that out. How does this work? Ah, oh, okay, that slides out of there. My God, look at that. So we have this asymmetrical design. We got that um, trademark display there. Always makes me think of a Lange and Zone. And if you know the story behind the, the opera uh, theater that uh, inspired that design, it's quintessentially German, of course. So we got days and then the 12 months and this will uh, change 
that typical three-quarter plate uh, characteristically so German and then look over here this is a butterfly bridge kind of like us it's like two swan neck regulators together these are actually hand engraved and then this I'm not gonna say micro rotor because it's still rather big but uh, a really big display back this astonishingly has a hundred hour power reserve I'm definitely intrigued as I said I'm not a fan of the rose gold but it's nice just to see it in the flesh and experience these amazing pieces let's just get a, a rough idea of its size oh it's 42 it's yeah, a little little large shame 12.4 not that bad there very heavy because of the gold content i'm presuming this is 18 karat although i'll have to double check that but yeah absolutely stunning so am i going to pull the trigger on the fc well i feel i need to explore a few more options first it may be a bargain when it comes to Swiss-made tourbillons, let alone one from an established and respectable brand, but it's still a lot of money. There's also a number of British brands I want to experience, for obvious reasons, if you didn't already guess, from my grandfather's Charles Frodsham, also in the intro. Then, rather predictably, there is always JLC, the watchmaker's watchmaker, and I feel all horological roads kind of lead to JLC at some point, a brand that is something of a family tradition, but also the very first factory tour we ever shared on the channel. A first for YouTube too, way back in 2017, before social media became oversaturated with all the derivative, vapid watch dealer content of today. Being a sucker for Art Deco, it would be criminal for me not to look at a few reversos as well, so stay tuned for that. And I do appreciate any suggestions in the comments. Okay, there we have it guys. Thank you so much to Frédéric Constant for so generously lending this tourbillon in. I'm seriously considering selling, <laughs> selling one of my Rolexes to buy it. Stay tuned, maybe I, I might do a video about that if I decide to go for it. Also thank you to Moya Fine Jewelers an authorized dealer for Glassuta Original. Uh, stay tuned for the full review of that next month. So yeah, I've got a lot to look forward to. Don't forget to like this video, especially if you want to support more free and independent content like this, it really does help. I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Onwards and upwards. Ciao.